Well, hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, glad to see you all. Um, I'm Annie Murphy-Paul. I'm a journalist who covers uh, the science of learning and creativity. My most recent book was called The Extended Mind, The Power of Thinking Outside the Brain. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about creativity. I think a lot of us uh, think of creativity as something a little mystical, magical. We don't really know how or why it happens. But fortunately, uh, psychologists, I love psychologists, are studying how exactly creativity unfolds. And we're really lucky to have two such researchers here with us today. Um, we've got Keith Sawyer, a professor at uh, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He has written many books on creativity, um, one of which is uh, Group Genius. And we have Sheena Iyengar, who's a professor at Columbia Business School. And her most recent book is called Think Bigger. So there's a lot of myths and misconceptions about creativity, and our two guests today are each sort of taking aim at one particularly big uh, myth or misconception about creativity. And Keith, I'm going to start with you to ask you about the myth that cre creative ideas come from uh, lone geniuses, you know, brilliant minds working by themselves. And I understand that you got a kind of uh, clue that that wasn't always the case in your hobby of playing jazz piano. Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how your experience as a jazz pianist playing in, a, in an ensemble uh, contributed to your interest in collaborative creativity. Oh, thanks for that question. When I started studying the psychology of creativity in graduate school, um, I discovered that all of my psychology colleagues were studying cognitive processes that take place in the mind. I've been a jazz pianist since a very young age, and for me, creativity was about the interactional dynamics between the musicians and the ensemble, and I found myself getting inspiration and playing better when I was with the group than I played when I sat at home by myself rehearsing. So for me, this improvisational improvisation, ensemble improvisation was what creativity was all about, but no one was studying that. Mm -hmm. So that became my niche. I did my PhD dissertation. I did a book on improvisational theater, Chicago improvisational theater, which is very similar to jazz in terms of the interactional dynamics. So for me, this idea that surprising new creativity emerges from improvisational interaction between people. And when you think about it that way, you really aren't thinking about the lone genius anymore. Mm -hmm. So I started looking around at all these stories about innovation and creativity that we all hear the famous genius inventor like Einstein inventing relativity or Isaac Newton inventing gravity or the theory of gravity. And when you scratch beneath the surface, you always find that the lone genius is not the way it really happened. You scratch beneath the surface of the history, and I've done this in my book, Group Genius, and you see a long set of small ideas from different people over time. One of the stories I like to tell is of the Monopoly board game, which all of us know, best-selling board game of all time. It was released by Parker Brothers in 1934. They gave a press release saying that a man named Charles Darrow invented Monopoly while reading a book down in his basement. The classic lone genius myth. He's unemployed, he's in the basement, he's reading, and he comes up from the basement with Monopoly. He gets a patent and he goes to Parker Brothers and in the first year it sells a million copies, which in 1934 just was unheard of. So I started scratching beneath the surface of that lone genius myth and it turns out it's completely false. Charles Darrow did not invent Monopoly. It actually emerged from a 30 year process. It started with a Virginia Quaker named Lizzie Maggie. In 1904, she developed a board game that looks a whole lot like Monopoly. She called it the landlord's game. And her goal with this game was to teach this, at the time, very popular uh, economic system called the single tax system, which was not getting a whole lot of traction politically. She says, I'm going to make a board game. It's going to teach everybody how good the single tax system is. That doesn't sound anything like Monopoly, right? So it didn't go anywhere. She was frustrated. She started sharing handmade copies of the Monopoly, the landlord's game, with her Quaker friends. And it really caught on because Quakers were fans of the single tax philosophy. And then up and down the East Coast, the game spread out of Virginia. And what started to happen is everybody had to make their own copy of the board. They would get canvas or linen and they would draw the board on it. 
And in each city, this practice emerged of changing all the space names to be neighborhoods and cities, neighborhoods and streets in your city. So whatever city you went to, you get a different version of Monopoly. So here's Charles Darrow 30 years later, where this game has been, and it changed a lot along the way. Different Quakers, different cities. There were fraternities in the Midwest. There was a professor at Columbia University who was using it in his economics classes. And all of these new ideas emerged. The idea of grouping three spaces together to make a monopoly, that was not part of the 1904 landlord's game. So it emerged 15 years after that. So Charles Darrow, visiting some Quaker friends in Atlantic City, played the Atlantic City version of what was then called Monopoly, thought it was pretty cool, went back home and ripped off the game. He basically copied it lock, stock, and barrel. He got a fraudulent patent. He went to Parker Brothers, and he was sold by Parker Brothers as the inventor of Monopoly. So that's a great mm -hmm. example of when you scratch beneath the surface. What you see is these um, small ideas over time in a very distributed community of people resulting in the emergence of something surprising and new, like three spaces being monopoly. For me, I see that through the lens of jazz improvisation, where in jazz, each musician contributes, whether it's a phrase or it's a rhythmic variation, and that contribution, everybody else who's listening closely, takes that and builds on it and elaborates, and you have these small ideas from like second to second in a jazz ensemble, and something surprising and new emerges that no one in the group could have predicted. So that's the way I see innovation when I look around, even if it's the 30-year process that transforms the landlord's game into monopoly. For me, I see that as this kind of improvisation because it has the characteristics of interaction between individuals over time, resulting in the emergence of something surprising and new that no one knew was going to happen while they were engaged in that process. Mm. Thank you, Keith. That feeds really nicely into the big myth about creativity that Sheena takes on, which is that a creative idea is something utterly new, something that no one in the world has ever seen before. And Sheena, in your book, Think Bigger, you talk about how creativity actually arises from the recombination of familiar elements. And you have a story as well, I think, um, of a woman named Nancy Johnson. I wonder if you could tell us about that. Oh, sure. So yes, every as Sean Pater told us back in 1911, every innovation is nothing more and nothing less than a new combination of old ideas. And you can literally take any innovation from any point in history and do what I'm about to do, which is take it apart and show how that innovation is just a combination of pieces that are elements that existed before. Um, and so um, one of the stories that um, I tell in my book, Think Bigger, is the story of an innovation which is one of those few innovations which has not yet become political, and I hope it never does. <laughs> it's also one of those innovations that's truly global, no matter who you are, where you are, what economic strata, what part of the world you live in, you love this thing. At least I have yet to hear anybody critique this thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> um, and ice cream was made accessible to the globe, uh, or at least first in the United States, and then it went elsewhere in the early 1800s. So it was, uh, it was around during the time of George Washington. Uh, George Washington bought a tub of ice cream, a small tub of ice cream, and he paid $190. Okay, so just imagine paying that much money for a small tub of ice cream. So it was around, it was just very, very expensive. And there was a woman by the name of Nancy Johnson, an ordinary woman who lived in the early 1800s in Philadelphia. She was the wife of a chemistry professor. She was a woman who was in her 50s. She was a missionary. She was also a uh, abolitionist, part of the Underground Railroad. Um, and so back then, you know, she took on this problem, which is how do you make ice cream accessible? Now, I'm going to describe how she comes up with this idea, and everything I'm going to describe to you is factually true based on her patent, although I'm going to describe it using my words rather than perhaps, however, I don't know exactly how she would have told the narrative. So what's the problem she's trying to solve? How do I make ice cream accessible, affordable? That's the problem. Why is it so hard to make ice cream right now? 
Well, first of all, when you're, the way they used to make ice cream at back then is they would take a bowl, fill it with ice, then put a little bowl in there, fill that with the milk, and then you would churn, 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 churn. It's getting harder and harder, so it's back-breaking labor. It's melting even as you're stirring it, and it's also forming lumps. So what are my three challenges? How do I keep it cold? How do I make it easier to stir? How do I prevent it from forming lumps? And so now that she's got her three challenges, she now has to figure out what are the ways to solve for each of these challenges. So challenge number one, how do I keep it cold? Well, she takes a water pail, which had already been around for over 400 years, and now she asks herself, I'm gonna fill this up with ice, I'm gonna make a lot more ice cream, but what do I put the milk in so that it stays cold? Well, back then, Men used to drink beer in pewter mugs to keep it cold at the local tavern. And I say men because women weren't allowed to go to the tavern back then. But she takes the pewter and she makes a vessel that she's going to fill the milk in. And that's what's going to go into the water pail. Now she says, well, how do I make the labor of stirring it less hard? And she takes the hand grinder, which back then was used for grinding coffee and spice. So that's going to make it a lot easier to stir. But I still have the problem of lumps, because as I'm stirring it, it's going to form lumps. Now, back then, when making ice cream, they would use normal spatulas. But one of the things that it's speculated that she learned about from the, from the runaway slaves, and we had many more runaway slaves from the sugar plantations, because the conditions were even harsher there. And what would happen in the sugar plantations is they would make molasses by stirring very hot liquid with sugar, and they needed to prevent the formation of crystals. And the way they did that was they used these spatulas that had holes in them so that the liquid could go through. So now what you do is you take these spatulas with holes in them, attach it to the hand grinder, and voila. You have water pail, pewter vessel, hand grinder attached to these spatulas with holes in it, and you have what was dubbed as a disruptive technology by the Library of Congress in 1843. <laughs> <laughs> that is. We're turning to Keith now for a moment. If you see creativity as a process of emergence that, um, <clears throat> that is generated through improvisation, how can we structure improvisation sufficiently so that it, it's as fruitful as possible without sort of quashing that playful, spontaneous spirit that makes um, improvisation so, so generative? It's a great question. I think it's a common misconception that improvisation means a lack of structure and that you'll be more creative as an improviser if you remove structure. In fact, we often think about that with creativity more generally. Structure, convention is opposed to creativity. But when I study improvisation, I see really, I won't say just the opposite, but a much more subtle story that the right kinds of structures can enhance the improvisation. And improvisation is always this balance between structure on the one hand and freedom and flexibility on the other. So as jazz musicians, we know that we're always playing with structures. There's a 16 bar, 32 bar song form. There's a certain set of combinations of chords that are very common. There's a melody to a song. When you're soloing, your solo line often weaves around the melody. All of those are structuring elements, but jazz musicians don't perceive that as a constraint, right? Those things actually enhance your creativity. Being able to think of the melody in your head while you're improvising actually makes you improvise better. And I can attest to that. If there's other musicians in here, it's the same. And with improvisational theater, if anyone's participated or if you've seen it, those theater groups will often have guiding structures that they agree on ahead of time to help an effective plot emerge. So I think that's my mm -hmm. key takeaway from your question mm -hmm. is this tension between structure and improvisation, which isn't really a tension if you've designed your improvisation uh, in a careful way. Then it's a longer story. You can read my book, Group Genius, mm -hmm. about what kinds of constraints or structures are more likely to lead to an effective improvisation. It varies depending on your goal. 
if you're looking for more of a breakthrough innovation, if you really don't know where you're going, if you don't know how to think about the problem, if you don't even know what the question is, creativity research, as we call that problem-finding creativity, when that's the situation you face, it's more effective to have less structure. But if you have a more clear idea of the problem and you feel like you formulated it pretty clearly, then more structure is appropriate and more likely to lead to that surprising new emergence of the idea. And the structures, of course, if it's group improvisation, it's a structure that everyone in the ensemble is sharing, right? If you are using a structure and no one else is using the structure, mm -hmm. then that's not going to be an effective um, improvisation. So this is the role of conventions, and Howard Becker calls it the etiquette of improvisation, hmm. which is really what everybody shares that makes the improvisation work. Everyone who plays jazz well has a lot of experience listening, listening to other groups and other musicians who are brilliant, who've been playing over the years since the mid-century, and uh, listening closely to the other musicians in the ensemble. So they share a common language. I guess I could think about it that way. Instead of thinking about it as a constraint, mm -hmm. think about it as a shared language mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that enables effective improvisation. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Keith. Um, turning to Sheena for a moment, um, Sheena, I understand that you uh, acknowledge that there's often a collaborative aspect to creativity, but that conformity pressures within a group can also inhibit creativity. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you can balance those individual and collective activities and also share your v views on brainstorming. Oh, sure. By the way, one of the things that Keith just reminded me of is, is a very famous quote by Wynton Marsalis where he talks about how jazz without constraints is noise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 no, sorry, you just reminded me of that. So I, thought mm -hmm. it. Um, so I got a question for you guys. Think back to the last time you had your best idea. The last time you had your best idea. Where were you and what were you doing? Now, I'm blind, so I just want you to call out what you were doing. In the Walking, shower. yeah. Hiking. In the, in the shower. In the shower, yeah. Sleeping. Anything else? Swimming. Sleeping, swimming, walk, biking, walking, what? Driving. Driving. Mm -hmm. Talking to somebody. Mm -hmm. Talking to somebody. OK. How come nobody mentioned brainstorming? <laughs> <laughs> How many of you have done a brainstorm? Raise your hands. About what percent? Everybody. Oh, 100%. About 100%. How many of you have had your best idea come to you in a brainstorm? Raise your hands. <laughs> OK. So, so, you know, I guess I don't have to. I mean, there's actually science behind it. There's actually lots of papers that show you that brainstorming is not an actually an effective method for uh, creativity. But I don't really need to tell you about the science. You just found it out yourself. Um, and I have done that very little exercise that I just did with you right now with over 100,000 people by now. Maybe a handful, a handful of people will tell me that they had their best idea in brainstorming. Brainstorming is fun. It's really cool. Think of the five best rules of brainstorming. Build on each other's build on each other's points of view. Let out all the wild ideas. Quantity over quantity. Just let them out. It's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. It's like great rules for having a most wonderful dinner conversation you can imagine. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as much fun as it is, you rarely come up with an idea that's actually useful. Why? Because we're so busy trying to build on each other's ideas and come up with wild ideas. Um, and so it's, not, it's actually a wonderful way to have a great conversation, but it also leads to narrowing your thinking, a lot of conformity because you're building on each other's ideas. It's, I, mean, I, there's, I mean, I could do a whole talk just on why brainstorming doesn't work. So, but in general, it is not the most effective way to, brain, to get a best idea. If you have to brainstorm because your, your boss demands it, at the very least, before you go into a brainstorming session, think for five minutes about that problem, even if you think for five minutes about that problem first by yourself, you will increase the quantity and the diversity of ideas you generate by about three times. Hmm. And why is that, Sheena? Why does it work that way? Because when you're first thinking by yourself, 
Well, do you want me to talk about how the brain actually forms ideas? Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So how do you form an idea? Think of your brain as this giant inventory system. A library system, Excel spreadsheet, you take your pick, that they're all doing the same thing. So essentially you have, you're collecting from the moment you're born, you're starting to collect even before you start talking, information bits. And you're putting it on different shelves across your brain. And so when I ask you a question, you go to that portion of your brain and you pull down everything you know about that. You know, like, like ice cream, like let's say today, it's affirmative action. You pull down everything you've ever heard about that. And what you're doing is you're bringing up all the stuff that's accessible to you. Now, if I want to get you to come up with more stuff, then I either have to prime you to think about, you know, other por to go to other portions of your brain and reframe the question. Go to other portions of your brain where else have I seen things that might be similar? Or I need to get you to go outside of yourself and go talk to people so that you actually collect more information, bits in your brain to generate an idea. Now, when you do it by yourself and you just ask yourself, what do I think about X? What you're going to do is you're going to generate whatever you know about this. And then person B is going to generate whatever they know about this. Person C, person D, person E. Hopefully, if they have different experiences, which most people do, they will generate different information bits and therefore different ideas before they start sharing. If they start ideating while they're sharing, then the moment person A speaks affects which portions of the brain person B starts going to, and then which portions of the brain person C, C starts going to. So you thwart diversity of thought. Right. Uh, so in my book, Group Genius, I have a chapter about, I guess you could call it group stupidity, <laughs> which is about this brainstorming research. And it's a very solid finding from uh, people who do organization studies that brainstorming tends to result in less creativity. So that seems like it might be a challenge for my group genius hypothesis, but really it's, a, I would say, it, it's a way to help you think about how to enhance absolutely all the things you've said, thinking in a solitary way in advance, and the fact that you really do enjoy it, researchers call it the illusion of group effectiveness. <laughs> uh, and I've done this in executive education workshops, too. I put people together. And the brainstorming condition always comes up with fewer ideas. Hmm. Uh, so where you need to go to is this idea that you also came up with, that uh, combinations in the brain are always behind any new idea. More distant combinations are more likely to result in surprising new innovations and similar combinations. So imagine something that's conceptually very similar and you had, um, I like to talk about Reese's peanut butter cups, right? Peanut butter and chocolate. You combine them, you get a new innovation. It sells, it makes a lot of money, but it's not that surprising. You get two snack foods, now you've got another snack food. Um, but how would you think about a distant combination? Uh, an example I like to use is think about combining a newspaper and a potato chip. It's not immediately obvious what that combination would be. In fact, it could be a lot of different things. So if I had more time, I would ask you to, um, let's not call it brainstorming, <laughs> but come up with ideas on your own. The thing I think of, or what actually did happen, is Pringles prints. It's the kind of Pringles potato chips that are printed with edible vegetable-based dye, and that could be how this idea emerged. It's a newspaper, it's a potato chip. It's not exactly a newspaper. It is exactly a potato chip, but it could be a and lot of And whether it's a good idea is an open question, whether right? But, but, you, but Keith told me he sold very well. It's so. <laughs> Kids love it because they have dorky jokes on them. <laughs> um, so you have these distant combinations. That's the power of group dynamics. If you are engaging with someone whose mind is filled with different stuff, That's and right. if it's more different, more distant, from what's in your own brain, then you're more likely for that interaction to result. I think a lot of times when you're in brainstorming groups, it tends to be people who are very similar to, to you, right? You're in a, your team, the team that you're with all the time. And it's your boss that you're with all the time. Uh, it's gonna be a lot more effective if 
you're in that room with someone who maybe you've never even met before. Mm -hmm. So if brainstorming doesn't really work to generate create, creative ideas, like how, you know, what is, that puts me in the mind of what, what, how should we go about uh, generating creative ideas? And Keith, I know your most recent research, you've been looking at art and design professors and how they teach students how to create good creative work. And they have a very different approach. They don't start with the idea, as I understand it. Is that right? Right, right. I think of it, and everything I'm going to say now is something that an artist or a designer has told me because I've been interviewing these professionals for 10 years now. And all of them are also professors in BFA and MFA programs. One thing they have to um, disabuse their students of is this I the idea that you need to have a big idea before you start painting or before you start doing your illustration, that I want to have that idea. When you think that way, you get in creative block because the idea never seems to be quite good enough. So the professors will talk about the importance of not knowing, that just start doing the work, start engaging in the practice with materials. Engaging with materials in a sort of dialogue is an essential part of that. And you need to trust that process while you're in this state of not knowing. It's very anxiety provoking when you're beginning on your career as an artist or a designer. But once you've had some successes, you realize engaging in the practice results in the emergence of these small new ideas along the way. And that's where your idea comes from. It comes from doing the work. So you start the process without knowing mm. what you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then at the end of the process, when you look back, you can see how your painting emerged. But when you started the process, you didn't know what was going to emerge. And that's the nature of improvisation as well. Hmm. It's that same process, but scaled up to the group, where different members of the group are contributing small ideas. You don't know ahead of time what your improvisation is going to result in. That's essential. If you know ahead of time it's not improvisation, at the end of the performance, you look back, and it's a coherent performance. The audience has liked it. Uh, and you can see how it emerged. You can track those small contributions and how they built on each other. But at the beginning, you don't know. Mm -hmm. So it's the importance of not knowing and starting to engage in the process and trusting that these ideas are going to emerge. Every artist, sculptor, painter, printmaker, book artist, every designer, graphic designer, even architects, they all tell me the same thing. And some of you here in the room may be one of these professionals. Uh, we can talk afterwards with the um, individuals. I interviewed 100 different people at some of our top art and design schools. This is what, it, it's actually very hard to teach students because it's frightening to engage in a process where you don't know mm -hmm. yet that you can trust it. Mm -hmm. And you don't, you're not sure because the student hasn't seen it happen over and over again that engaging in the process will eventually produce good work. They, they need to trust that, it, that that is the case. Right, they want it to be good because first of all, they're gonna get a grade. <laughs> mm -hmm. Secondly, all of their peers are gonna see what they make. Then their professor's gonna see it. You know, you're 18 or 19 or 20, you want your professor to think you're awesome. So you're like, I gotta have this good idea. I gotta, they want certainty. Uh, everybody wants certainty, right? Uncertainty, clear psychological finding, uncertainty makes people anxious. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so this is something you have to be in this state of constant uncertainty mm -hmm. to engage in a successful creative process. So that's what I see with professional creatives, artists and designers, is the importance of not knowing. And secondly, the importance of doing the work. Just start doing and trust that those ideas are going to emerge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And of course, another part of creativity is knowing what is good, you know, sort of um, choosing among all the maybe many solutions that you've generated or the sketches that you've generated. And actually, Sheena, you are maybe well, best known for your, um, your work on choice. Uh, you wrote a wonderful book called The Art of Choosing. And you've said that you see clear connections between your research on choice and your more recent research on creativity. And you use the wonderful, wonderful word, sorry, the wonderful word, discernment, that discernment is really uh, a skill that we need to bring to being creative. Could you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, before I do that, I just wanted to build on something that Keith was talking about. So if I were to ask you guys, if you were to combine uh, Uber with high fashion, what idea would you come up with? <laughs> Anybody? Rent the runway. 
Exactly. <laughs> now, if I were to ask you to combine um, Planet Fitness and Amazon and Blockbuster, what idea would you come up with? What? Peloton. Well, I guess Peloton came later, but sure. I'd build on that too. What came before that? Jane Fonda did videos. <laughs> That's another one. Actually, I hadn't thought of it. Netflix was the one I was thinking of. Okay. But one exercise, you know, since we're talking about how to become creative and we're talking about how every idea is a new combination of old elements, one of the things you can be doing is a sort of, you know, like a fun little exercise that's just building that creativity muscle is looking, at, taking things and saying, you know, if I were to combine them, what could I create? Things that exist in your world. If I were to combine them, what could I create? And also looking at ideas that exist in your world and tearing them apart and say, what was this made of? You know, like, like, like um, the wine press and the coin mint led to the printing press. You can even take this far back in time. All right, so what is the connection between, between choice and creativity? It's true that for most of the study of creativity, it was done by, you know, ethnographers, or, or, um, anthropologists, engineers, artists, etc. In fact, brainstorming was invented in 1938. Now, I'm somebody who came to the study of creativity via the root of choice, and it turns out. That, that actually makes a lot of sense. Now, I will admit to you that I didn't always realize that in the beginning, that it was actually very closely connected. But the great French polymath, Henri Poincaré, who was the inspiration for both Picasso and Einstein, once said that invention consists of avoiding the constructing of useless combinations and consists of the constructing of useful combinations, which are an infinite minority. <laughs> to invent is to discern, is to choose. Now, when we think of choice, we think of it as solely a picking and finding exercise. I have to think of it as a choice optimization exercise because of you know, the, the strong influence of economics. But in, in truth, the real power of choice doesn't just come from its, your ability to pick and find. It comes from your ability to create. And how do you create? You create by pairing your ability to pick and find with your ability to imagine. And that's what we were talking about just a few minutes ago when I was talking about how your brain forms thoughts. You essentially go into your brain, look at all the options that you've learned about from your prior experience, and you combine and recombine and reconfigure until you find that most useful combination, which is an infinite minority. Right. What you said is just brilliant. This notion of discernment uh, resonated with me. These artists and designers, I've been interviewing them about how they teach students. And the book I'm writing, I've decided to call Learning to See, because they say this, this is what I'm doing. I'm teaching students how to see. I say, well, how do you teach students how to be creative? They're like, no, no, I'm not doing that. Hmm. <laughs> no one can teach people how to be creative. I'm not doing that. I'm teaching them how to see and how to think. So then what is how to see? Well, I, if I could give you a lecture, you wouldn't need four years to get a PFA program. But learning to see is essentially this discernment. And when students enter these programs, they, the professors will say they don't know how to see yet. Well, what could that mean? I mean, they have good technical skills. They submitted a portfolio to gain admission to this program, so they have some chops. But they don't know how to see. What does that mean? They don't have this discernment. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is one thing you need to learn to be an effective creator. The students according to these professors. Some of you may be students in these programs, so don't take it personally. <laughs> but um, sometimes you don't realize what you've made. Mm. You've generated something, and if you don't have that discernment, sometimes you think you've generated something different from what you really have, and you're not able to see which things you've done have the most potential. And that's this notion of being learning to see is being able to see when there's potential in what you've done, when it has the possibilities to lead to something new. Um, 
when it's working, this, this idea of working comes up all the time. This sketch you made is working or it's not working. I think that's discernment. And it, it's something that you can learn, you can acquire. Um, I don't think it necessarily comes to you easily. It's something that takes some effort and some experience. But yes, learning to see, I'd say that's discernment. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a few minutes before we have a, a Q and A, and we'll open it up to you guys. Um, so I wanted to ask you each to share uh, one or two really practical, concrete things that anyone in this room could do to be more creative. Sheena, maybe you could you could start. So I teach people how to come up with their best ideas, and it, I take a very structured approach. So what I told you about how the mind works. And what I told you about that quote, I essentially about from Henri Poincaré, I essentially make that a toolkit and give people the tools to create those combinations. And so, um, I would say I would give you two tips if I had to do it in a couple minutes. One is when you have a problem, and we all have problems, big, small, professional, personal. The first thing you want to do is on a piece of paper, and it does matter to write it down, write down what is that problem you want to solve and write it as a question in one line. That makes it concrete for you. And once you say, look, you know, how do I do X, whatever X happens to be, you now ask yourself, who has solved this problem successfully? And that's how you go about it, either do your Google search and be clever about that, or you go out and figure out who do you want to talk to? What kind of a person? Maybe you know that person. Maybe you know somebody else who knows that person that has solved this problem because I want to learn tactics. I don't just want wild ideas. I want ideas that come from different places and different people that I can import in to my problem to solve it. So that's tip number one. Tip number two is when you have those great aha moments, like you guys mentioned earlier that you've had, you know, how many times do you have a great aha moment and then you go in and you tell your spouse or your loved one and they're like, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so, and Lord knows, I think I've solved the world's problems in the middle of the night mm -hmm. and in the morning, it always looks awful. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so what you do when you have an idea and ideas are very important. That's what keeps us motivated. And sure, most ideas suck. Um, but when you have an idea and you want to figure out, is it, you know, what do I do with this idea? What's the core of this idea? How do I improve this idea? What you do is you make it a habit to walk up to people, people you know, maybe even people you don't know so well. I'm very fond of talking to strangers. And you give them your idea. And then you ask them, Hey, how would you, if it were you, how would you describe this idea? You're not asking them if they like it, dislike it. That doesn't matter. You're not asking them to do a memory test. That doesn't matter. What matters is when they describe it to you, what do, the, what do you learn about your idea? What was the core of the idea that stuck with them? What did they kill from your idea? What did they reframe? What did they add? That's when you learn about how to edit your idea. That's brilliant. Thank you, Sheena. Keith, how about you? What do you think? Uh, okay, so it's hard to pick two, but I'm going to... Uh, the first one, I would say, we've been talking about the power of distant combinations, bringing together cognitive material that is uh, conceptually distant uh, from each other, combining two things that are similar, you, you'll get a new idea, but it won't be that surprising and new. So think about your daily practice with this in mind. How can you get different conceptual material into your mind? There are a lot of different ways you can do it. One of them is to take up a hobby or just be a dilettante in something. Learn something just a little bit. You're not any good at it, but you learn enough that you're getting cognitive material from that. When it gets to the group level, it's very comfortable to be interacting with other people that are a lot like you. And most of us are in environments where we are with other people like us in a team, in an organization, or uh, wherever you are, even with a group of friends, likely to be people a lot like you. If you can interact with someone very different from yourself, 
who has different cognitive material in their minds, then you have a real exchange where you're truly listening to absorb that cognitive material and combine it with what you have, and you're giving to them as well. So I would say seek out different practices from what you do on a daily basis, and then in group dynamics, try to put yourself in situations. I think this is the power of the Aspen Ideas Festival, mm -hmm. honestly. Mm -hmm. We're bringing together lots of different people. I've seen a lot of conversations going on at these receptions, and people really are open here. It's almost like there's a, a cultural norm in this group that you can talk to anybody, mm -hmm. and they'll talk back to you. They won't perceive it as rude, and that's mm -hmm. very powerful. I've really enjoyed being here. Um, so that's my first thing, seek out distant combinations. The second one, so the first half of my career, I studied jazz improvisation and improvisational theater and business teams. And when I did that, I see the importance of improvisation and unpredictability. I see the importance of interaction between different people. And what happens when you have unpredictability and interaction is you have emergence. The emergence of something new and surprising that you couldn't have predicted ahead of time. For the past 10 years, I've been studying how professional artists and designers create. And they don't tell me about collaboration in our interviews. They talk about a very solitary process. But the solitary process has the same characteristics. It's, improvisation, it's improvisational and unpredictable. You start engaging in the work and you don't know where it's going. You don't need a big idea at the beginning. In fact, if you have a big idea at the beginning, it derails the power of that not knowing. So that's the nature of solitary creativity. Then interaction, where does that come in in art and design? These professional creatives talk all the time about the importance of working with materials, physical materials, right? You, they always say, you need a pencil and paper, even if you're going to become an Adobe Creative Suite expert. They'll still ask you to illustrate with pencil and paper. And this is the nature of creative practice, is this interaction, it's a dialogue. So you put something out in the world in material form, then you can engage in a dialogue with it. So there's interaction. It's still outside of yourself, but this time it's not out of, outside of yourself with other people, but still it's outside of yourself with these materials. So getting something out there that you're interacting with in an unpredictable and improvisational way, you have those two things, and then you have the emergence of something surprising and new from the process. So you're trusting that not knowing process. So I see this, really it's the same process, but at different levels of analysis. The group level, the individual level, it's all about the process. It's not about the idea. And it's a process with these three characteristics. It's improvisational and unpredictable. There's an interaction of some sort with something outside of yourself. And then you're waiting for this emergence of something surprising and new and different. And if you're engaging in the process and you trust in the process, that will happen. The ideas will emerge. That's fantastic. Thank you, Keith. Um, I'm going to open this up to questions. But first, I just want to lead a round of applause for these amazing experts. Wow, thank you. Thank you. Are we, we're using a microphone? OK. Um, I think somebody had a question right there. Hi, thank you. This is awesome. Thank you for giving us so many great things to think about. How do you in, include visualization in the creative process? So do, I, you? do you want me to take this? Or you yeah, we'll need short answers. We have six minutes. Okay. So it's a big question. <laughs> so what I described to you as the second tip is something I call the third eye test. It's do you see what I see? And so I think actually before you engage in any kind of prototyping or minimal viable market testing, you have to start if, by describing it. And when, they're, when I am able to describe it, my idea to you in a, in to multiple people, such that when they describe it back to me and there's alignment between what I'm seeing in my head and what you're describing back to me, that's when you're actually ready to prototype. And in my, in my method, that's the way you visualize. Hmm. How about you, Keith? We can go to the next question. Yeah, OK. I'll answer the next one. OK. <laughs> so, not knowing. Uh, could you hand the microphone to this guy right here? Thank you. Thank you guys for doing this. Um, so often in our lives, we're 
in groups where we're gathering to solve something, what are the actual techniques, given the limitations and challenges that you've described, what are the best techniques for groups to come together to at least arrive at as much creativity as possible? Well, thank you for that question, and I have a whole, whole book about this. There's so much research, and uh, you know, I'm a psychological scientist, so I believe in the importance of grounding everything you do in research and the advice. Um, I guess I would go back to what I've learned from improvisational theater interactions. One is more contributions is better. So conversational turns shorter is better. Instead of everyone talking one minute, have everyone give one sentence at a time. Uh, there's an importance of deep listening. Uh, a lot of times when you're in groups, you're not really listening that closely to what's coming from the other person. You're thinking ahead to mm -hmm. what you're going to say. Mm -hmm. The other person says something you didn't think they were going to say, and then you say what you were going to say anyway. <laughs> As you, in improv theater, um, we call that driving the scene, uh, writing the script in your head. So mm -hmm. you're not deeply listening. So mm -hmm. deep listening is absolutely essential. Short, small contributions one of the biggest myths about creativity is that it's all about the big idea and the big insight, where really what I see in groups and individuals, these small ideas over time build to an emergence of something that can be big. So I don't know, if there's a lot of other answers I could give, but I'd say make your contributions small, truly listen to what the other people are doing. The conversation might go in a different direction than you thought it was. And be okay with that. <laughs> Do we have another question? Oh, yeah, um, uh, over here in the blue shirt. Thank you very much. Um, question is, in the world of Microsoft Teams chat, <laughs> Slack chat, mm -hmm. WhatsApp, et cetera, mm -hmm. might there be a useful combination of solitary thinking time across a day or a week for each individual and then bringing those different content ideas together. You know, open-ended question, Microsoft Teams have the team weigh in over the next week. Mm -hmm. I absolutely endorse that, that you want to start by having people first think independently. Um, and then the purpose of a group is for sharing information and for sharing thoughts. And so back to the question right before you, 72% of groups and companies fail uh, to solve for the problem uh, that they set out to solve. They end up solving a different problem. And because mm -hmm. where you do need to have really important conversation is what exactly is the problem you're trying to solve? Most people take that to be self-evident. Um, and that's actually where initially a lot of the work has to be. As Einstein once said, if I had an hour to save the planet, I would spend the first 55 minutes thinking about the problem and the last five minutes thinking about the solution. I'll add from my, um, my own psychological knowledge that one problem with people sharing information in groups is that people often end up sharing the information that they all sh have in common, because it's easier to talk about something that you all have a common touchstone for. But you want to make sure that you're sharing your uniquely held information, the thing that only you know. And that takes a little bit of courage, because you have to stand out there and say, this, this is my perspective, this is my experience. But that's the only way you're going to get that true diversity of, uh, of views. Right, I love that Einstein story. Absolutely, in creativity research, we call it problem finding. And it is the contrast with the big idea view of creativity or the big insight. If you have the big insight up front, then you already have decided what your question is. The question isn't going to emerge along the way. The questions that emerge along the way that you didn't have at the beginning of the process, those are the ones that are gonna result in more surprising and breakthrough innovation. Be receptive to this idea that you might be thinking about the problem in the wrong way. So 55 minutes thinking about the problem. Uh, and then if the problem is formulated in an effective way, you're much more likely for a good solution to emerge. If you're trying to solve the wrong problem, hmm. uh, you might have a creative idea, but it won't be as good. It won't be as surprising. Another question, building on the visualization question. Um, I'm curious how much you guys sound like you're talking about how to use cognitive intelligence to activate imagination. Like even the ice cream story has a lot of technical fixes to solve technical problems, as opposed to what I know is a little debunked, but let's say not left brain, but right brain 
intelligence, tapping into intuition, um, vision, you know, what can you picture in the future that other people can't picture? What's the vision where creative intelligence tries to quiet the problem solving, idea building mind to tap into? I'm just so curious about what is the science or the brain this? science yes. of tapping into right brain creative intuitive intelligence mm -hmm. um, as opposed to, again, some of uh, this is an ideas festival, um, but to quiet the thinking mind to stimulate the intuitive fantasy imagination mind. So there are over 5,000 tests out there on the web that you can find to help you figure out if you're left brain or right brain. And they're all untrue. <laughs> okay? I never, ever, ever want any of you to take those tests. Mm -hmm. I never want any of you to believe that you're either a right-brained or a left-brained or a creative type or an analytic type. Every single one of us is engaging in the exercise of creativity from the moment we're born till the moment we die. That is just, it's, it's as uh, this person, this wonderful woman here in the front mm -hmm. pointed out to me before mm -hmm. the session began, it's just like every human being across the globe has fallen in love at some point in their life. Mm -hmm. That is also an exercise in creativity. Mm -hmm. So that left brain, right brain debunked, and it has <laughs> been debunked by science for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, now, in terms of a myth, yes, I know, but I wanted to make sure, wanted to make sure that we got rid of that myth. Okay, debunked. And if you want, I can later show you pictures of MRI machine scans of physics, physicists, and um, mathemat uh, sorry, physicists and creative writers as they're doing their thing, and it will show you that all portions of the brain are, are lighting up. So the process that is being used across those two types of tasks, even though we think of them as different, it's actually very, very similar. Now, in terms of your question of how does imagination work, Look, if each of you were to close your eyes right now, and you know I can't see, but just close your eyes, mm -hmm. and now imagine this entire room right now, every single detail from the ceiling to what the person next to you was wearing on the bottoms of their feet to the behind their butt, um, and now open your eyes and you look and you see what you missed what you will, and what you got right. What you will discover is you got maybe like 50%, 60% right if you're lucky, most of it you made up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You just put in images that made sense to you, and that's because of what you already have in your memory bank. Your memory bank draws on experience and plugs in stuff that makes sense. That's what we're constantly doing with our imagination. Right. It's, uh, that gets to this idea of learning to see again. Mm -hmm. uh, before people have this ability to see, and this comes up in illustration classes. It's like the first class you take in art or design school, foundations class. Um, students will do this, right? It's as if you closed your eyes and you sketch something that you already had in your mind and you don't see what it is that you're supposed to be sketching. Um, and that's the power of I mean, knowing to, how to see, right? So just to jump in, so I am blind, right? I don't see a, a thing. I don't even see light. Rest assured that in my mind right now, I have imagined this room. Mm -hmm. I have imagined what you look like, like that lady in the back whom I you know, gave a slightly hard time about right and left mm -hmm. brain. I have imagined what she looks like. I've imagined what this wonderful lady in the front here looks like. I have no idea whether I'm correct or not, and it doesn't actually even matter. <laughs> That's how imagination works. You're constantly seeing. Right. I, I think I think we're out of time, so we're gonna have let's have another round of applause for her. Thank you. Thank you.